10 millimeters of adjustment either direction. No, man, I need to stop for a second. Hey everybody, I'm Mike Kazmer. Welcome to the Pink Bike Enduro and Freeride Field Test. We've got a bunch of bikes with 160 millimeters or more rear travel that are designed for going downhill, but still being able to pedal up. Up next, we've got the Rocky Mountain Altitude. This is a bike that had a very strong debut under Jesse Melamid on the Enduro World Series. It probably feels nice for Rocky to launch a bike and have it tick off some victories right away. This bike has 160 millimeters of rear travel with a 170 millimeter fork. It's available with either a carbon frame or an aluminum frame and the wheel size depends on the frame size. So large and XL frames, those are 29 inch wheels. Medium and small, those are 27.5 inch wheels. Um, and there's also a medium with 29 inch wheels. So medium kind of splits the difference, but small riders, 27.5 inch wheels. The Altitude uses Rocky's smooth link suspension design, their version of a horse link, with the rearmost pivot located on the chain stay. For this bike, they took the kinematics from the previous Altitude and the Instinct BC, and kind of combined them to get the best traits of both. So. That ended up giving this bike anti-squat values of a touch below 100% at sag and a nice smooth progressive leverage ratio. Bikes also come with a different shock tune depending on the size. That allows lighter riders to make the most use of that travel and bigger riders to avoid blowing through that travel too easily. The bike also has Rocky's Ride 9 system, which allows you to adjust the geometry as well as the suspension progressiveness. Um, so you can, depending on the position, there's nine positions. You can make it have more ramp up, less ramp up, uh, be slacker, steeper, so we'll touch on that when we get into the geometry. Let's go over some of the altitude's frame details. You've got internal cable routing, plenty of room for riders that want to run their brakes moto style. These little guides can be replaced, so you can run it either way, depending on your preference, something that not all carbon frames have. Generous chain slap protection, those little ribs that help keep things nice and quiet. You also have a little protector between the chainstay yoke, just to help keep grit and mud and rocks from getting pinched inside there. There's also adjustable chain stays that allows you to adjust the chain stay length by 10 millimeters. Uh, you do need to swap out the brake mount, uh, but it's a pretty quick process and kind of allows you to fine tune that bike to your liking. And then one final detail is the fact that this has a modular shock mount. So basically this front part here, that's replaceable. So potentially in the future, if Rocky wanted to change the size of shock that works on this bike, um, they could just offer another little link, and let, you know, make that be able to be swapped out. So a little bit of future proofing there. Let's go over some of those geometry numbers. Like I said, it has nine different geometry positions. In the neutral setting, that gives you a 65 degree head tube angle, and a 480 millimeter reach. But for the testing here, I ran it in the slackest position just in order to kind of level the playing field out against some of the other bikes in this category. Um, that gives it a 64.4 degree head tube angle and a 474 millimeter reach. It also gives it a fairly slack seat tube angle of 75.4 degrees, but the good news is the effective seat tube angle is fairly steep. So that helps make it not feel like you're too far over the bottom bracket. Like I mentioned before, there's those adjustable chain stays that allow for 10 millimeters of adjustment. It can be set at 437 millimeters or 447 millimeters. I ran it in the long setting. I just preferred that. It kind of felt like it matched the feel of the bike, but again, pretty quick switch so you can you know, set that up the way that you like. This bike is the Carbon 90 Rally Edition, which is built up with a part spec that mimics what the Rocky Mountain Enduro team is racing on. As you'd probably guess, they're not racing around on entry-level budget components, so that puts the price of this bike at 9,099 US dollars. Digging a little bit deeper into the parts, you've got full XTR drivetrain and brakes, four piston XTR brakes, you've got a float X2 shock in the back, you've got Fox 38 up front, 170 millimeters of travel. It's got that grip to damper. And then you also have a nice race face. Next R, carbon bar, race face stem. So basically high end everything. And that's reflected in that price tag. As this bike sits, it weighs in at 31.3 pounds, which is impressively light considering the burly build kit. As usual, getting this bike set up involves installing the Maxxis control tires. It's worth mentioning that this bike actually comes with double down tires, front and rear. So nice spec out of the box. It's already dialed, but to keep things even, swapped them out for the XO Plus casing control tires that we had on hand. Other setup notes, I did remove one volume spacer from the shock. Because I was running the bike in the more progressive slack setting, I felt like I was getting too much ramp up at the end of the stroke. Took one volume spacer out, helped me be able to use all the travel with smooth sailing from then on. Let's talk about climbing. I mentioned earlier that the seat tube angle on this bike isn't the slackest but I also mentioned that steeper effective seat tube angle. 
It seems to balance things out and I don't have any complaints about the climbing position on this bike. I'm five foot 11 and it just felt nice and comfy, upright, kind of felt in line with the other bikes. I wouldn't have guessed that it was quite as slack as it shows up on paper. So I'd say that's, you know, that number is not something to be concerned about. As far as the way that the suspension feels while pedaling and, and during climbs, it is on the more active side of things. You don't have quite the same level of support that you would see on say that propane that we have in for testing, that propane spin drift, that feels like a more efficient climber. While this bike, you do get a little bit more bob, especially if you stand up and really kind of reef on the pedals. Uh, good news is that climb switch, really easy to reach. I used it for the longer fire road grinds, not a big deal. I'm not as opposed to using that switch as Levy is. This bike's an enduro race bike after all. Typically on those transfer stages, you could just firm things up if you wanted to. But if you decided to never touch it at all, it's still not a horrible climber. I'd say not the most efficient feeling pedaler, but it's comfy, there's lots of traction, and the lightweight helps as well. That active suspension that I mentioned during the climbs, it pays dividends on the descents. This bike has great grip. You know, if you're getting some loose terrain, kind of slippery, it really feels like it's contouring the ground in a nice way. The frame itself doesn't feel too stiff. There's no sense of harshness. And it's a really easy bike to maneuver around. It's not super long, it's not super slack. You know, it's built as a race bike and you can certainly go fast on it. it kind of has that all mountain feel. In fact, out of all five bikes we have here for this, uh, for this field test, it's probably the one I'd be most likely to grab just for kind of an all day pedal adventure. By the same token, there is plenty of speed on hand. The way that it corners, you know, with those longer chain stays, it just kind of gives it a nice balanced feel and it's plenty quick for tighter terrain. There's good ramp up at the end of the stroke. That Float X2 has a nice bottom out bumper. So if you do go through all the travel, you don't really feel any harsh clanging at the end. Um, and once I removed that volume spacer, I was able to use all the travel when necessary, but it never felt like I was blowing through it too quickly. Overall, it's a nice and plush bike. Like I said, lots of grip, lots of traction but then you, know, you can still send it without bottoming out too easily. And even though I had it in that longest and slackest setting, it never felt like a handful. Like I said, it kind of feels more of like an all-rounder rather than a purebred downhill machine. For time testing, I put down my fastest lap out of all five bikes. The course is kind of your typical sort of an enduro stage, a little bit of rolling sections, some steeper straight ahead sections. And I just felt like I could maintain speed really well on this bike, easy to get around corners, and it just felt comfortable no matter what the terrain was doing. So fastest lap, that goes to the altitude. Let's talk about the components, how they held up. Now that XTR drivetrain, flawless, super crisp, clean shifting, shifts every time, shifts under load. Big fan of that drivetrain. It's nice you got those aluminum cranks, you can bash them into rocks and not feel too worried about things. The XTR brakes, they worked well. I did have to bleed the rear brake at one point. It was starting to get that inconsistent lever feel. The bleed helped fix things up. Um, and I mentioned in the first look video for this bike, but those XTR pads were radically out of the box. Something that happens with pretty much all of Shimano's finned pads. I ended up putting some mastic tape on the brake caliper to see if that would quiet things down. And that did the trick. Maybe Shimano can take a lesson and kind of figure out how to quiet things down. But overall, I think most riders will need to spend, you know, five or 10 minutes to a little extra step to make things nice and silent. Other highlights, that Float X2 shock worked really well. I really like how the kind of the end stroke ramp up and that big bottom out bumper just gives it the bottomless feel that you'd expect from a bike like this. On those turbine wheels, I did notice that the spokes, they kind of tend to get a little bit loud, especially in hard corners or kind of harsher landings. They're straight pull spokes. There's something about them that kind of makes this twang noise. They stay true. There's no dents or anything like that, but they are a little bit noisier um, than some other wheels. Pros of the altitude, well, for one thing, it's super versatile. It's built as an enduro race bike, but you can do a lot more with it than just line up at the starting gate. Bigger all mountain rides, it can certainly fit the bill, aided by that lightweight. It also has tons of traction, like I mentioned. I think that might be my favorite part of it. It's just how well it just grips. You can find traction in those slippery loose times where you on other stiffer bikes that don't want to hug the ground as well, kind of lose it. This one just hangs on, keeps you on track and going fast. As far as cons go, I do think that Rocky could have made this thing even slacker. Now, I don't want to be the guy that wants to keep saying, it needs to be longer, it needs to be slacker. But with this bike, you have nine geometry adjustments and right away I put it in the slackest position and I probably could have gone a little bit slacker. And I put money on the fact that the next version of this bike is going to be slacker. In fact, I've noticed that the Rocky team, they're already running one degree angle sets in their bike to make things one degree slacker. So it would have been nice if you had a little bit more range towards the slacker side of things with those geometry adjustments. Still, if this bike had shown up and it had that 64.4 degree head angle out of the box and no other adjustments, I would have been fine with that. So 
just a little note, but if they're gonna have adjustments, you might as well make it so you can make this bike extra slack. Another note, as far as cons go, those Rattle XTR pads, I mentioned them before, they're just annoying and I wish they didn't rattle, so, but it's fixable, that's the good news. And then finally, this bike just doesn't really offer the best value, like I said, a lot of high-end parts, but that price is pretty high. There are bikes that have similar or even better parts for less money, so something to consider, but this is team spec and it matches exactly what um, is being used to win Enduro World Series races, so you can't really complain about that. So who's the altitude for? Well, it's certainly a bike that's capable of winning Enduro races, but you don't need to have pro-level skills to make the most of this bike. Very enjoyable, very neutral, easy to ride, and it can work well on a wide range of terrain. Everything from you know all mountain to days in the bike park. It's a good all-rounder, and it also happened to put down my fastest time on it. So kudos to Rocky, he made a fast, fun bike. Well, that's the Rocky Mountain Altitude. Uh, don't forget to stay tuned for more videos from the Pink Bike Field Test, including our Huck to Flat. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.